Good morning. Welcome to the Orchard Oxford Online. My name is Alex. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. We're so excited that you're joining us this morning, wherever you may be, and joining us as we celebrate Mother's Day. I want to tell all of them, all of the mothers out there, Happy Mother's Day. We also recognize that mothering uh, is a is a big term that encompasses a lot of different things. So we want to even recognize mother-like figures in our lives. One of the things that we're doing here in person for our congregation is encouraging people to write letters to influential women in their lives, letters of gratitude, of thanks, and just recognizing all that they've done for us. And so we want to encourage you to do the same, to write some maybe an influential woman who's been impacting in your life, and write them and just tell them how grateful you are for them as this series is all about influential women that we find in the scriptures. We also want to recognize today that Mother's Day is not always a joyous day for everyone. Maybe this is the, the first year that you've celebrated Mother's Day without your mother here with you. Maybe Mother's Day every year that it rolls around, you get a, a little tinge of sadness in your heart because of the journey of becoming a mother and just how hard that has been for your story. Wherever you find yourself this morning, even if you find yourself celebrating with your mom this morning, we're grateful that you're here today. We believe that, that God is leading us into uh, a really great series this week as we talk about uh, influential women in the story of Scripture, and so we're excited that you've joined us here today. Let's pray together as we uh, kind of enter, enter our time of worship this morning. Let's pray. Father, we come before you with all kinds of emotions centered around today. For whatever Mother's Day means for us, whatever it is classically meant for us, maybe it's a brand, new, uh, a brand new day for us, that it has brand new meaning this year. Maybe it's our first Sunday as a mother uh, to celebrate Mother's Day. God, whatever it may be, whatever situation that we find ourselves in, Lord, we want to bring you those honest emotions. God, we want to bring you what we feel, what we know, because Lord, we know that you can, you can handle it. So God, as we come before you this morning, God, I pray that you would open up our hearts, that you would soften our hearts. Maybe Mother's Day is classically a day where our hearts remain a little more hardened. God, we ask that, that you would begin your work, that you would allow your spirit to begin the work of softening our hearts to be able to hear your words today. As we open up your scriptures, as we dive into your word, God, may you speak and may you move in a way that only you can. Father, we love you. We thank you for today. We thank you for what today means, whether good or bad. We thank you for the opportunity to worship together, for the gift of technology. Lord, we are so grateful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the year was 2004. I was visiting one of my best friends from high school. His name's Steve down in Florida. And we had a long, hard day together. Uh, we were doing some work on his house and uh, we decided just to kind of hang out at another buddy's home. And he's like, hey, let's go out to this back river canal. Uh, my buddy's got these paddle boards. Let's just kind of uh, have a chance just to enjoy the waters. And so we, we rode them kind of unconventionally. We weren't on standing up. We're kind of just on our bellies and in a swim-like motion, moving our hands and our legs. And I got to the point in the river canal where like, it's just completely peaceful. My arms and legs are just kind of dangling in the water. And my buddy Steve's a little bit further up the canal and he turns around and he yells at me and he says, Eric, Get your hands and legs moving, buddy. There are alligators out here. And just to show me how serious he was, he said, last week we caught a three or four foot alligator, taped its nose and threw it in a buddy's bed. Here's the thing. I grew up in Ohio. I don't care if you're from Ohio or you're from Mississippi. I don't do alligators. Not at all whatsoever. I completely panicked. You know, there's a word for what happened in that moment. We would call that a plot twist. It's this unexpected development in my story. I went from peaceful in the water to panic, and how will I handle this crisis or adversity in front of me? Now, plot twists happen in every great story. We see this happen in movies, books. For you Star Wars fans, may the fourth be with you this last week. But we know the greatest plot twist in all of the Star Wars series is that when Dark Vader looks at Luke Skywalker and says, No, I'm your father. How will Luke handle this crisis? We think about maybe the famous story, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, where Aslan eventually gets killed by the white witch on this stone table. 
We're like, what's going to happen now? The king of the beast is gone. And then the plot twist happens. Aslan is resurrected. We didn't see that coming. Every great story has a plot twist. And the Bible is no different. I don't know what your expectations are when you come to the scriptures, but the scriptures are filled with a ton of plot twist, impossible battles that happen. And guess what? They're won. People who we would view had no faith at all, maybe faithless, receive a full measure of God's faith, and God does incredible things through them. We look at people and kind of the, the mess of their lives, and they, we recognize they feel unworthy, and God declares that they're beloved and worthy. The Bible has a ton of plot twist. You know what it also does? Your story, my story, our lives. Uh, we begin today a brand new teaching series called Plot Twist. Friends, my name is Eric. I'm so excited that you've joined uh, us this morning, that you've carved out space to hang out with us. We never take that lightly, but we're excited in the plot twist of our lives in this teaching series. We're going to be looking through pivotal characters in the scriptures, key women who we learn from their story, find our story in their story, and it's our hope than how they handle these scenarios that we might learn, adapt, and have a willingness with open hands to say, Holy Spirit, work through our lives. So today, we're going to be looking at the story of a character by the name of Lydia. You're going to find her story in the book of Acts, the 16th chapter, verses 6 through 15. I want you to kind of turn right now. If you've got a mobile device or a Bible in front of you, turn there. And while you turn there, I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to read this passage, and then we're just going to continue to jump right into it. Thank you for being with us today. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we come to your word this morning. We would ask that we would hear from you, that this is not about my words, it's about your word, inspired, that it gives us life, it gives us breath, it gives us a sense of direction on where we need to go, and we say thank you for this amazing gift. We pray right now, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we would see you clearly, that in any plot twist in our life, however we may feel right now, God, we are open to take risks and chances, and that would you give us boldness and courage to respond to things that you're calling us to be about We just don't want to know a bunch of stuff right now about you, God. We want to know you personally and experience you and walk in faith in that. In your name we pray, amen. So today's story doesn't start with Lydia. It starts with two characters by the name of Paul and Silas. If you've got your Bibles along, let's read this passage, and we'll just jump right into it. Acts 16, verse 6 and following. Next, Paul and Silas traveled to the area of Phygeria and Galatia, because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. Then coming to the borders of Masia, they headed north to the province of Bethnina. But again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. So instead, they went to go through Mysa to the seaport of Troas. That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. We boarded a boat at Troas and sailed straight across to the island of Samotras, and the next day we landed at Neapolis. From there, we reached Philippi, a major city of that district of Macedonia and a Roman colony, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went a little way outside of the city to a riverbank, We thought people would be meeting for prayer, and we sat down to speak with some women who had gathered there. One of them was Lydia from Thyteria, a merchant of expensive purple cloth who worshipped God. As she listened to us, the Lord opened her heart, and she accepted what Paul was saying. She was baptized along with other members of her household, and she asked us to be her guest. If you agree that I'm a true believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my home. And she urged us until we agreed. So the story begins with these two characters, Paul and Silas. Now, Paul was not always known as Paul. He was Saul, what we read about earlier on in the book of Acts. And in the first century, Saul was kind of public enemy number one for Christians or followers of Jesus. Why is that? Because he advocated and endorsed for the persecution and the killing of several Christians. And in a supernatural way, Jesus meets Paul on this road known as the Damascus Road and has his life completely transformed. Uh, Saul, who becomes Paul, it's kind of his new name, marking a new point in his story, 
literally opens up his heart and his life to be completely sold out to follow after Jesus. In this story is evidence that he just continues to say, God, wherever you want to go, I will go and share people with the hope that Jesus is that this Jesus, God's son, the perfect one, who had no sin, well, he takes on all of our sins so that we can be made right with God. That's good news. That's the gospel. Now, you caught here in this moment that their trip and where they thought they were going to go gets completely sideswiped, and they have to go in these opposite directions. What I love about Paul and Silas is that God is directing them. It's divine guidance. It's not some human strategy that's directing their mission. They hear from the Holy Spirit say, don't go here. And finally, they conclude to go to Macedonia, having it says here that God was calling them a call here to preach the good news there. Now, when we read all of these cities in this passage, and there's a ton, wasn't there? You can get confused. Like, where are we at? I don't even know all the cities here in the state of Mississippi. How do I kind of connect the dots? But here is a pivotal moment in the story of kind of the history of Christianity as a whole. God calls them to Macedonia, northern Greece. This is the first time in all of the story of human history that the gospel, the good news of Jesus, will go to Europe. So consider that for a moment. I don't know your ancestry. I've got some ancestors from Europe. But because of Paul and Silas's faithfulness in this moment, Stepping where God called them to go, they're faithful. And the story of the gospel, as we'll read here, gets expanded. And who's not to say centuries upon centuries after that, we in fact are inheritors of their faithfulness. Pretty incredible. But in the moment, I wonder, we can look at it kind of looking backwards, the risk that they had to take. Standing on the shore of the Aegean Sea, God calls them to go to Macedonia And their lives could be kind of summarized in that one word, risk. I've heard it said before that faith can be spelled R-I-S-K. There's a risk here. When I look at Paul and Silas' example, I wonder to myself, am I living like they are? Because I don't know about you, my life is filled with a ton of what I would call calculated risks. You know what I mean by that term? It's a term that kind of came up in the beginning of World War II. Generals would make these calculated risks, looking at the battles in front of them and determining, will this result or end in failure, or will we have victory? And based on those kind of two ends of the spectrum, they'd make a calculated calculated risk to endure that battle. Now, as the years have gone on, the business market, human resources departments, they have look at calculated risk all the time. Should we hire this person? We may feel like, oh, they don't have kind of this expertise in this particular field, but they're more of an extrovert. They've got quality characteristics about them. They're highly coachable. So we're going to take a calculated risk and hire that individual. Now, that works well when we think about maybe a general of the battle, a business hiring somebody. But friends, what happens when the gospel or followers of Jesus, our lives compelled for the gospel, becomes a matter of what we would call risk management. What happens when our lives centered on the gospel become a matter of risk management? Well, it's not good news. What ends up happening is that we will become risk averse. In the long run, we don't take risks and we will be unable to actually reach people that have been unreached from the gospel. People far from God will never find him. At some point, we have to believe that the things that God is calling us to, that those risky decisions are worth the reward. And this story reminds us it's worth it because we get to this story and we hear Lydia, who is the main character of today's story, she comes to put her faith in Jesus Christ. And that has a ripple effect that just doesn't end with her. As we'll learn, it goes to many other people. Before we get there, what do we know about Lydia? Well, Lydia is from Thyteria, which is actually not in Macedonia. That's like over in Asia Minor. Many scholars believe that ethically she's Asian. Not only is she Asian, she's extremely loaded, wealthy. I don't know if you caught on. She's got a house in Thyteria and also in Philippi. She's a fashionista. And what I mean by that is she's a, a merchant of expensive purple cloth in the first century. For her to have two homes, 
Uh, to be a woman, this would not have been the cultural norm. It would be kind of like the equivalent of somebody in the fashion industry today having a home in New York City as well as in L.A., bouncing back and forth and making a huge, massive, wealthy income. That's her story. So she's from Asia Minor. She's Asian. She's wealthy. And we get this other detail that she's down by this riverbed worshiping God. Some translations would say she's a god fear. What does that basically mean? It means that Lydia has not bought into the idea of worshiping multiple gods, which would have been the case. Philippi is a Roman Greco city, tons of temples everywhere. People would have worshiped multiple different types of gods. She believes in worshiping one God. We would know this to be the God of the Old Testament, that this is Yahweh, the God of Israel, that she would lean in and know is probably the Old Testament stories and the scriptures. She has recognized from hearing from the words of the old prophets that she's in desperate need of forgiveness of sins and salvation. But as much as she knows, this is where the bad news enters. To recognize your sin and your need for salvation, something that the Old Testament talks about nonstop, but having no connection that Jesus Christ is the hope that she truly needs to actually forgive her, to let her live this abundant, exciting life here and now and forevermore. Well, she hasn't heard that story yet. But then Paul. Paul enters the scene of the story. And I always laugh at this story. Paul essentially walks into what is a women's Bible study or prayer meeting. Now, friends, this is dangerous territory. And I don't mean that in a mean way. I've walked into several women's Bible studies before. It's dangerous because it's powerful. I've seen women who've approached the throne of God and, and begging God in prayer and studying his word do some pretty revolutionary things. Philippi doesn't have a temple dedicated to the God of Israel. Paul finds a small select crowd, this women's prayer and Bible study down by a riverbed, and what little spiritual, what we would call scaffolding or framework that Lydia has, Paul connects the dots that she's missing, shares the story of Jesus. And the good news that we find in the story is that Lydia, who worshiped God, recognized that she listened to Paul, God opened her heart, and she accepted what Paul was saying. That's a great reminder for us today. That are we praying are we praying for God to open people's hearts and then just faithfully share whatever is laid upon our hearts and trust that God will fill in the rest? Remember that our success in the gospel moving forward is always just going to be about us saying, Lord, we pray, we share, and we trust that you'll do the saving part. You will take care of the rest. And it happens. Not only has Lydia put her trust in Jesus, we, we learn about the next greatest response that she has. She's baptized. Not only her, like her whole family. This would have been the equivalent of like three or four family members and what scholars tell us probably maybe up to the end of like 12 servants. This is the workings of the first church in Philippi. And friends, I want to give you this invitation today. Uh, baptism is probably the most fitting response for us all to make if we put our trust in Jesus Christ. Uh, baptism doesn't save us. Essentially what baptism does is this outward sign of kind of this inward personal decision that we've made. We've trusted, we've repented in our sin, we believe in Christ. And just like Jesus himself was baptized, we take that stance as well. Paul would talk about later on in the New Testament that when we're baptized, we're baptized into the church. This is a family decision that we would kind of hoot and holler and rally and help one another out and keep one another accountable. That's why we need other believers just like these early believers in Philippi needed each other. And friends, if you haven't been baptized before, I can't urge you enough. Maybe the most important thing that God is asking you to do today is reach out to one of our pastors here at the Orchard Oxford. Nothing gives us more joy than to have those types of conversations. And I do believe in faith today that God is calling some of you to make that decision. If you haven't done it, let's chat. Send us a private message, email us directly. And likewise, if you have an infant in your life right now who they have not had the opportunity to be baptized and you want that to be a marker and a milestone in their story, in your family story, friends, we would be honored to be a part of that too. Please make that call today. Lydia's story reminds us in the plot twist that came her way, she didn't see this story coming at all. It turns out in the best way possible 
In the plot twist of life and us coming to the big aha of our own brokenness, we find the hope of Christ and in the response of that is to accept him and to be baptized. And maybe that's where some of your story is right now. Maybe that's the plot twist that God wants to work in your life right here, right now. Now here's what I know. We could get to the end of this story in verses kind of 14 and 15. And just say, hey, this story's good enough. Let the credits roll, two thumbs up, it's done. But it keeps getting better. And I'd urge you to read the rest of Acts 16 sometime today. I'm going to kind of fill in some of the blanks. But Lydia learned this big aha, the plot twist of her life is that, man, she is worthy. She is loved, not hated by God. And in the second plot twist, which I imagine she's going to pinch herself here, just out of excitement that this, yet she's very useful in this area of business, that God's got even bigger plans than that. God's going to leverage her wealth to realize that she is very useful, not useless in the kingdom of God. What ends up happening, if you've got your Bibles in front of you here, read about this here in verse 15, that she urged Paul and Silas to come to her home. But what we learn later on is there's some other characters that get joined to this church. There's one who in Acts 16 is this demonic, poor, oppressed girl that she's only known for her ability to kind of give fortunes to people. And Paul and Silas are actually able to, in a supernatural way, declare healing over her life and she's free. She now joins the church at Philippi. And then after that, Paul and Silas will be thrown in jail. That's another plot twist for another day. And in that jail cell, they proclaim the gospel, the good news of Jesus, to what we would probably label this kind of blue class, uh, uh, basically middle of the road, kind of Roman patriotic jailer soldier who he comes to know Christ. He's, these two characters, think about that. This demonic poor girl, Lydia, who's extremely wealthy, and then a middle class blue collar type of jailer. Man, this is a messy picture of a first church. But where are they going to hang out? You've got your Bibles in front of you. Look here at verse 40. When Paul and Silas left the prison, they returned to the home of who? Lydia. There they met with the believers and encouraged them once more. Then they left town. Paul and Silas left town. Lydia will take a risk. The risk of her reputation, the risk of her wealth, she will be the hospitable presence of allowing uh, what could be up to almost 20 now some people between, you look at her own family, her servants, this demonic girl, maybe her connections and the jailer, and the list would go on and on. It's pretty incredible. Lydia is literally a leader, kind of a church planter for the first church in Philippi. And yet she would probably sit in that house of hers and look at kind of the diversity of all of these characters and think that this is an incredible mess. But guess what? It wasn't a mess. Jesus redeemed it and the mission went on. Paul would write this letter 10 years after this scene right here. It's called Philippians. Find it in the New Testament. It's in your Bible as well. And Paul would encourage the Philippians to keep going strong in what he already established here in Acts 16. Uh, I'll throw this this reference up on the screen. It's Philippians 1, verses 4 and 5. Paul would say, Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy, for you've been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard until now. Friends, we're not a problem. God views us as partners in the gospel. And that's the story. Ten years later, Paul's saying, You give me incredible joy, Lydia. Because from the moment I first met you until 10 years later, you've continued to have this long obedience in the same direction. We're partners together, yet I'm in a different location and you're still in Philippi. You're a partner in spreading the good news about the Lord. You know, at the orchard, we say this phrase occasionally, the gospel came to us because it needs to head to somebody else. And Lydia knew that to be true. And friends, do you know it to be true? Who is that somebody else for you in your life right now? Who's close to you that we sometimes underestimate that if we would faithfully say, God, open their heart and help me to share as I can, that the impact that that might make, that they might be basically set on fire for Christ and they too would share the story. 
Great investment in a few always equals a greater kingdom impact. And that's what happens. Friends, I think about the story of Christianity as a whole on this Mother's Day. And there are multiple women, mothers and women-like figure, mentor figures in people's lives who've made a massive dent by just simply pouring into the people that are right closest to them. I think about the story of Henrietta Mears. It's probably a name that you don't know about. But I want to read to you the comment that somebody made about Henrietta Mears. She has had a remarkable influence both directly and indirectly on my life. In fact, I doubt that any woman outside of my wife and mother has had such a marked influence. Her gracious spirit, her devotional life, her steadfast for the simple gospel, and her knowledge of the Bible have been a continual inspiration and amazement to me. She's certainly one of the greatest Christians I have ever known. That's a pretty powerful recommendation. Do you know who wrote those words? Dr. Billy Graham, arguably the greatest evangelist in the 20th and 21st century. That Dr. Graham would hang out for a couple years with Henrietta Mears after his college years, that outside of his mother and his wife, she discipled him more than any other woman. And guess what? Dr. Graham would go on to share the gospel with over 2 billion people worldwide. Henrietta Mears, just like Lydia, shared faithfully with the story of Jesus to those that were closest to her, and God, she trusted, took care of the rest. That she took that risk, and it was worth the reward. Who are your mothers? I'm grateful for my mom and for other inspirational women in my life. Thank them today. Write them a card as we've given you that challenge, but here's one of the greatest ways that you can thank them and honor them consistently give your life away. Reproduce what was introduced to you in Christ Jesus through many of these faithful women. That's maybe one of the greatest plot twists of your life as well. You didn't see it coming. The story doesn't end with you and I. It continues on as others come to know Christ. That's what Lydia did. And friends, we're no different. Jesus believes that we can do it. He commissions his disciples. He commissions every follower that we would go at the Orchard Oxford, we're clear. We want this consistently to be a place that grows deep in the love of Jesus Christ and branches out to others with that same love. We believe that in that process that we help introduce people to Jesus. And after inter being introduced, they grow up to become more like Christ. That's what happened in this story. Ten years later, Paul was still seeing fruit in the Philippians' lives. And the final step is they're sent out. We're all partners sharing the gospel in our lives and our words with others introduce, raise, and send. Friends, it's the path that Jesus has called you and me. Lydia was faithful as well. But here's the question. Are we willing to take that risk? Do we believe that the risk will be worth the reward? People will be introduced, raised up to become more like Christ, and sent out. That's the reward. I want to take you back to that scene where I'm in that river canal. It's pretty crazy. You imagine that moment where I was panicked, went from peaceful to panicked, and I remember yelling at Steve, my friend, and saying, if you knew there was alligators out here, man, why did you bring me out here? And Steve said these words that I remember almost 20 years ago that still have stuck with me. He said, if I would have told you there were alligators out here, Eric, you would have never came out here with me. Thank you, Captain Obvious. But Steve was right. And what I have found to the level of conviction when I think about that comment years, tons of years later, is sometimes I treat God like I treat Steve. That I don't want to take a risk. I'm risk adverse. I want my life to be safe and predictable. And friends, Lydia's story reminds me that it just doesn't work that way. Life will have multiple plot twists. And in those, are we willing to wade through the dangerous waters trusting that Jesus can write a better story through every one of us. He says we can do it. Today's story, multiple other stories convict us that we can do it because we see that modeled in others. We pray for a plot twist. We take the risk. And will we choose to go? I hope you do. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, from my friends that have heard from your words today, 
wherever they're at in the plot twist of their lives. I pray that in that risky decision that they have to make, that they would not be frozen or paralyzed, that you would empower them to take that next step today. In your name we pray. Amen. Friends, we now come to the time of our response. This is a space for you to respond. You might want to pause the video. You may not. But I would challenge you today. In the plot twist of your life, Lydia reminds us to take that next faithful step. And so what is that for you? Is it reaching out to somebody? Remember, the gospel came to you because it's heading to someone else. Is it maybe God prompting on your heart to be baptized or maybe to have an infant in your family be baptized? Be faithful to that. Wherever you're at, however God is calling, take a risk today. Thanks. We now come to our time of offering, and we here at The Orchard believe that the greatest offering is when one gives their life away. And throughout the month of April, you guys uh, were heroes in the community because we were able to serve at the food pantry here in Oxford. Uh, we were able to provide food for families in need, and, and we served 386 families, which in total was 829 individuals in need. And we just want to thank you for that. Um, and, and we're going to continue in our time of offering, and we here at The Orchard believe that the offering is for those who call this place your home. Uh, if you're a guest tuning in with us for the first time, uh, we just want to thank you for, for carving out space and being with us today. Uh, if you are someone who calls this place your home, we believe in giving in response to a God who has given us everything. Let's pray. God, we love you. God, we thank you. God, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you for the love the grace and the mercy that you continually provide for us. God, it's a love that we will never be able to fathom, God. And somehow you look down on us uh, in our, all our sin and our brokenness and see us as someone we're dying for. We just want to thank you for that, God. We just want to thank you um, for who you are, for what you see in us, for our worth that you see in us. Uh, and we pray that... Um, as we live, we see you as a God worth living for. We love you. We praise you. We ask all this in your name. Amen. I want to let you know about some things going on in the life of our church. The first thing is for student ministry in June. We're going to be gathering together for the first two Wednesdays and the last two Wednesdays at lunchtime at a restaurant here uh, in Oxford. We're calling it Lunch Bunch. This is a time for us to gather together and eat together uh, and then go play at a local park. Uh, we're going to be sending out cards and, uh, that have uh, the times and locations for you. Uh, this is a great opportunity to invite somebody who may not be a part of a community of faith. If you're a student in our church, this is an awesome opportunity to invite your friends to gather around, to eat together, and then to go play together. So uh, during those times, bring your Bibles, bring money for lunch, and then bring a friend. That's what we'd love to have those first two Wednesdays in June and the last two Wednesdays in June. And the next thing I want to let you know about is the next Discover 201 class that's coming up uh, on May the 23rd at 9.30 a.m. down at the Lodge here at camp. Discover 201 is the next steps class uh, when you decide whether you want the Orchard Oxford to be your community of faith, whether you want it to be your home church. Um, it, it's an awesome, an awesome opportunity to ask questions with our pastors, to have a Q&A with them, and really fi figure out what the Orchard is all about and if it's the right fit for you. We'd love to personally invite you to that class if you're interested in going. Thank you so much for being here today. We hope you have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you next week.